Welcome to Lesson 1F, Alternating or Permutation Tensor. In this lesson, we'll define the alternating, also called the permutation tensor. It has particular application to cross products. We'll also talk about the epsilon-delta relation and do some examples. In the previous lesson, we defined the Kronecker delta function and applied it to dot products. Now we'll talk about the alternating tensor and how it applies to cross products. Consider the cross product of any two vectors, vector a and vector b, with some angle theta between them, and let vector c be a cross b. As you may remember from math class, this new vector c is perpendicular to a and b, and we use our right-hand rule to find that direction. If we let c be the magnitude of vector c, and a and b be the magnitudes of vectors a and b, it turns out that the magnitude of c is just a b sine theta. This makes c equal 0 if a is parallel to b or negative b, because in that case theta would be either 0 or 180 degrees, and the sine of theta would be 0. Let's examine this cross product using formal Cartesian analysis. We write a cross b equal a i e i crossed with b j e j, where the e's again are unit vectors. As we discussed in a previous lesson, we could move this b j outside of the cross product, since these components like a i and b j aren't affected by the cross product. So this is equal to a i b j times e i cross e j. But how do we evaluate this? To do that, we'll introduce the alternating tensor, epsilon i j k, also called the permutation tensor, or the repeating tensor. I'll generally use this term. We see that epsilon i j k is a third order tensor, so it has 27 components. Here's how we'll define it. Epsilon i j k is 1. If i j k is in forward order, which means 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2, it's equal to negative 1. If i j k is in backward order, 3, 2, 1, 2, 1, 3, or 1, 3, 2, and it's 0 if i equal j, or j equal k, or i equal k, in other words, any other order, like 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, etc. Out of the 27 possible components, 3 are 1, 3 are negative 1, all the others are 0. Here's how I like to remember it. Draw 1, 2, 3 like that, and if you're going in mathematically positive direction, 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2, 2, 3, 1, epsilon i, j, k is 1. If you go around clockwise in the mathematically negative direction, epsilon i, j, k is negative 1. Now let's go back to this cross product here. I rewrote our expression and it turns out that ei cross ej is equal to epsilon ijk times ek. This represents the scalar component of epsilon ijk, which is either 1, 0, or negative 1. And this is the unit vector perpendicular to both of these two. This is a vector. We know that the cross product of two vectors gives you a third vector. So using this equation, we write a cross b equal ai bj epsilon ijk ek but we generally would like to move this over here. Since these are all just scalar components, we're allowed to do that. So we get this result. Finally, we called a cross b c. So in what I like to call formal or proper Cartesian tensor notation, this is our final expression from here. In what I like to call simplified Cartesian tensor notation, we drop the unit vector e k. So we write it this way, and since k is our free index, c must also have a k index on the left side. This is thus our cross product in tensor notation. Note that it's balanced because k is a free index on both sides. This is a vector, this is a vector. i and j get summed because they're dummy or repeated indices. Here's a useful property of epsilon i, j, k. If we move an index two places, such as moving the i over two spaces, we get the same result. This also holds if we move an index to the left, where here we moved k two places to the left. So epsilon i, j, k is the same as epsilon k, i, j. But if you shift only one place, right or left, epsilon becomes the negative of the original value. For example, if we move the i just one place, we get the negative of the value. If this is 1, this is negative 1. If this is negative 1, this is positive 1. Again, this works whether moving to the right or moving to the left. If we move only one index one place, we get the negative. Take, for example, our cross product. We have ck equal epsilon ijk aibj. But we can write this as epsilon kij aibj. 
These two are identical since all we did was move k two places to the left. By the way, this form is easier for me to remember since ijk is in order ijk and then ij. And since there's one k, c has to have a k subscript. But sometimes it's more convenient when you're working on equations to write it this way. Let's do a fluid mechanics example. Let's take the vorticity vector. We'll use omega, which is defined as the curl of the velocity vector, or del cross u. I note that some authors use zeta instead of omega for the vorticity vector. This is what I use, for example, in my undergrad fluids book. But in these lessons, we'll use omega. Let's rewrite this in tensor notation. Let's use the equation we had above for cross product, recalling that this is how we write this vector expression for c equal a cross b in simplified tensor notation. We'll let ck here equal omega k. Epsilon ijk comes down. The vector a is the del vector, and the subscript is i, so this is del del xi. And then the b vector is u in our cross product with a j subscript, so we write uj. So we write the vorticity vector as epsilon i, j, k, del u, j, del x, i. Here's a caution. Don't switch the i and j in this term, del u, j, del x, i. I've been teaching this material for almost 40 years, and students will often write del u, i, del x, j here, remembering that cross product has a, i, b, j. But here, vector a is the gradient operator, del, del x, i, and vector b is our u, j. If you switch the i and the j, it won't be equal to the vorticity. One other comment about this. When we see an expression like this, keep in mind that this means the components of vorticity vector. But when you get used to using tensor notation, you'll recognize this as a cross product. Finally, there's a cool relationship called the epsilon delta relation. I won't prove it, but I'll write it out. When you have epsilon ijk times epsilon klm, where notice that these two indices are the same, but these two differ from these two. This turns out to equal delta IL delta JM minus delta IM delta JL. This is the epsilon delta relation, which will pop up in some of our equations later on and will be very useful to us. How do you remember this? Well, I remember it this way. The left-hand side has everything in order, IJK, KLM. For the right side, the first index is i and then j, and also i and then j. The second index is in order lm, but the second term is switched to ml, and there's a negative sign. By the way, this is a fourth order tensor, since we have four free indices, i, j, and lm. Or if you prefer, it's a tensor of rank four. When I teach this live, I always ask the students, how many equations does this represent? The answer is 3 to the 4th, or 81. Hopefully you see the advantage of using tensor notation. I'd hate to have to write out all 81 of these equations, but here I have a nice simple single equation that represents all 81 equations. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.